Hi, it's Dr. Ray, and today I'm going to walk you through a quick overview of young adult literature as we think about that as a genre, and an introduction to the novel we're reading, the young adult novel, The Last Unicorn. So moving forward, young adult literature. The age range typically is 11 to 18 years old. Of course, there's blur there, right? They're, they're, that's flexible. But typically when we're talking about young adult literature, we've moved past picture books, um, even past early chapter books, and we're moving into this genre of novels designed to capture the imaginations and shape the intellect of young adults, 11 to 18. Origins, of course there were novels written dur during the 1800s, and again, we call this like the era of the children, the Victorian era, when we're really celebrating childhood and the innocence of that age, that kind of fit this ideal. Like if you've ever read Little Women, or even some of the adventure novels like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Journey to the Center of the Earth, I'm talking about Jules Verne's, of course, um, Stevenson's Treasure Island, but these were not written specifically for young adults. They were enjoyed by young adults, but, um, they were written for a broader audience. But I think that's where this genre kind of started to take shape as this age group was captivated by certain sets of texts. Common themes, and I've accidentally like put my face over it, but just so you know, a Bildung's Roman, uh, B-I-L-D-U-N-G-S-R-O-M-A-N, is a German term for this kind of um, evolution, right? Uh, dealing with one's formative years, a spiritual education, if you think about Harry Potter, that's a Bildungsroman. Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, Bildungsroman. Um, Elsa in Frozen, Bildungsroman. Like it follows you from childhood through a series of adventures and not necessarily to adulthood, just till you've been shaped um, during a moment in your, in your adolescence. Other common themes, family struggles, uh, identity, politics, questions about religion and faith. Um, one's sexuality, sexual awakening, of course, being first crushes, being attracted to others, uh, relationships, and even substance abuse. And again, those are more modern themes, but they did start to emerge slowly in novels that were attracting younger readers in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So the 1940s, so think World War II, you know, a lot of um, young men are overseas, you know, they're serving, a lot of losses there. And this is the era when the term teenager is really coined. I mean, I'm sure someone said it before, but they become a demographic, especially for advertisers. If you've ever heard of the magazine 17, uh, that was published in 1944. All of a sudden they realized teens had spending power and they wanted to market things specifically to them, magazines, but also books. So in 1942, um, Maureen Daly published a book called 17th Summer. That's a romance about a girl like, you know, falling in love and learning about these emotions for the first times. It was a huge success and publishers were like, wow, we've got a demographic here. So all of a sudden they were marketing books specifically to teen girls. And then it's just such split gender. It's almost, it, it is frustrating. They marketed, um, sports novels to boys. And of course there were other genres, but these were the predominant ones that emerged in the 1940s. So that trend, you know, continued and kind of advanced. And in the 1960s, we see what we think of young adult novels really taking shape. Um, publishers come up with this term for the genre. We're like, we're calling it young adult fiction and it is marketed um, to this, you know, age of readership. Um, they kind of, like, again, I said 11 to 18, they kind of made it 12 to 18. So, you know, adolescence through the teen years. And of course there's blur there. I mean, I'm, I'm well past that age group and I still enjoy a lot of these readings, right? Um, the readings, they went beyond just trying to appeal to like, oh, they like sports. Oh, they like romance. And they were trying to really reflect the struggles, right? The, what's going on in the culture to consider serious themes. Maybe you've heard of Essie Hinton's book, The Outsider, which always blew my mind that she wrote it at 16 and like published it at 17. She wrote it in 1967 and it's about uh, the different social groups in high school and how things even became violent. Um, and it's just, it's, you know, stay gold pony boy. It's a wonderful novel. I suggest it. And even the eighties movie is pretty great. 
A Wrinkle in Time came out before that, 1962. Of course, it's a science fiction novel where the adolescent siblings, you know, need to rescue their father who's being held prisoner on another planet. So we've got sci-fi themes coming in. So really the 60s, we just see this really expanding and blowing up and all the genres are showing up in young adult literature, right? We've got science fiction, we've got realism, we've got drama, all these things. So when you get to the 1970s, you might recognize... um, some of these books like Judy Bloom, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. I considered teaching that one actually as our young adult novel and decided I wanted to do something where we could also introduce um, fantasy. But uh, the really a lot of more books that were focusing on the high school experience and talking about some of the issues more explicitly. So Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. She's in middle school, but it talks about things like menstruation and first crushes and how certain friends are like sexualized and teased, um, you know, for being, we won't even get into the rest of it, but just the, the, the drama of, of being an adolescent girl. The Chocolate Wars is a fascinating book by Robert Comier. Um, about just the brutality uh, and violence that can happen in high school. But the thing about these novels is they tended to be single problem novels, like facing growing up as a fifth grade girl or, you know, the the violence implicit to like, you know, the high school experience when, um, you know, people control the narrative. It just, it, it didn't, they weren't as nuanced. And not, I'm again, I'm not, not saying every novel written in the seventies, but a lot of them tended to focus on this one issue, right? before we move on to novels that it, that focused on more. So in the 80s and 90s, we get this burst of genre fiction. And this is when I you know, started reading these books. There's, of course, the wonderful book House on Mango Street. But there's also like these series. Um, if you've ever heard of R.L. Stein or Christopher Pike, there were like these horror series like Goosebumps and um, Highway to Hell and all these things. There's a Sweet Valley High series. We are seeing a rise in diverse voices. So like the marketing is changing. Um, it's expanding a little bit beyond this, like, okay, we've got this one problem, we're focusing on the high school experience. There, there was more variety, and thank goodness we were also seeing more diverse voices. One thing that's interesting about this era is I never knew there was kind of a population, not even dip, but there, there were just a, a smaller generation of readers. I haven't really unpacked the why, but what happened is in the beginning, the 2000s, huge population boom um, in terms of a whole generation of readers. There were a lot more, you know, young Americans reaching for books. And I think we have to give a lot of credit to J.K. Rowling, whether you find her problematic or not. Harry Potter was a huge success. And it showed that, hey, you know, young people will stand in line for hours to get an 800 page book, right? Um, That it just really sparked the imagination of a whole generation. And it you know, after following that was the Hunger Games and Twilight and just these kind of series that really grabbed um, readers' intention and investment. And a lot of looking at like both fantasy and dystopian novels, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, but presenting all kinds of issues. Again, moving past, this is what it's like to be in high school. And it's difficult to, you know, think about Harry Potter. It's a whole world of politics and power and good and evil and family and identity is the backdrop to someone's Bildungsroman, which is pretty significant. Currently, um, we're in this discussion right now as a country. We'll talk more about uh, next week about who decides what's available to young people, particularly like, you know, in, in school. Um We're still pushing for more representation and diversity, but there is still this huge boom of um, dystopian and fantasy novels. And a huge part of that, we'll get to that in just a second, but let's move on to that together. And also, I think it's interesting, a lot of uh, scholars are saying, oh, there's been a slight dip in the, the sale of books in the past two years is, is the like, you know, reading boom over. And I, I'm assuming that just COVID, everyone bought a whole bunch of books. And yeah, we're not buying at quite that level, but I don't think that means we've stopped reading. So why are so many of these books that young adult readers are reaching for? Why are they dystopian? And why are they fantasy books? So taking a look at that, um, I have a wonderful quote from an author here. It's not surprising that young adult fiction is always dealing with transformation, whether it be realistic or supernatural. It's the only genre that can always be both. It shows teen lives are full of chaos, and that means constant change. And so she's saying that that's why um, these novels fit so well. So when I'm talking about a dystopian novel, 
Um, it's an imaginary place or condition in which everything is kind of bad as possible. It explores the darkest facets of the human mind and human nature. Um, it's a genre that imagines worlds or societies where life is extremely bad because of depri deprivation or oppression or terror. Um, and you know, it could be things like squalor, oppression, disease, overcrowding. I'm thinking of like Ready Player One, um, Maze Runner, all these kinds of novels. And it captures the crucible of moving from childhood through adulthood because it's just so difficult already, right? And I think a lot of young readers identify with that. And, um, you know, a great uh, critic named David Levithan said, young readers love the Hunger Games, not because it's real that it happens, but the emotions there are real and it's very relatable. So just, you know, the trials and tribulations of growing up can almost reflect, you know, a dystopia sometime. So science fiction, in researching this lecture, I hadn't encountered this amazing series called Scythe, and it sounds brilliant and I recommend it. Definitely fits into the genre of science fiction, kind of like The Giver. Um, science fiction, of course, is a genre of speculative fiction that contains imagined elements that don't exist in the real world, or at least not yet. Science fiction spans a wide range of themes that often explore time travel and the future and deal with the consequences of advanced technology. So young adult science fiction books offer kind of an escape from the strictures of everyday thinking as it is now by adults that have you know, created the paradigms with which we live. And it allows the imagination to see beyond um, what they've been taught, what is really possible. You know, it's, it's the imagined, right, what things could be. Of course, we've talked about Harry Potter and fantasy, and it's kind of overlaps with the idea of fairy tales in just terms of, you know, we have the magical, we have... Um, We have magical elements set in like a fictional universe, and it's usually inspired by mythology and folklore. And if you dig into Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling did so much research um, on, in terms of the mythology and folklore and fairy tales she's actually pulling th from in creating the world she did for those novels. Sometimes they're romantic or historical or action-packed or all three, but the elephant of magic is what sets this genre apart, so keep that in mind. And paranormal and paranormal romances, I'll admit I am not a Twilight fan, no shame to anyone who is, um, but paranormal, paranormal romances seem to always be written in a way um, where the love is more true, more real than anything possible between two people. And just like the questions of being eternal and being young forever, I think that's one of the things that appeals to a young readership. So let's get to our book. So before I introduce you to The Last Unicorn, I want to introduce you to the author. So Peter S. Beagle is a Jewish American author. He's still with us. He's in his 80s now, but he was born in 1939 in New York City. Um, he was a very well-read kid. He got a scholarship to attend the university in Pittsburgh, a writing scholarship, and he started publishing as a late teenager. And some of his other works, in addition to Last Unicorn, which is his most famous, include A Fine Private Place, which was um, kind of a biography that he wrote as a teenager, which I find fa uh, fascinating. I haven't read it yet, but to have that much introspection to write a biography at that age, The Innkeeper's Song and Your Friendly Neighborhood Magician. So he's always kind of interested in this, not all of his books, but a lot of them in, in fantasy and pulling from mythology. He's a scholar. He was really into Tolkien's, is really into Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. And when they did a print of Tolkien in the United States, um, when he was a young man, he wrote the intro, which you have, have to tell you as someone who's done some scholarship, you need to know a work inside and out to be the one who's asked to write an introduction. And if you've ever seen, there was an animated movie, and again, I'm dating myself, but I, you know, I, I saw it long before the, um, Lord of the Rings movies came out, there was an animated version of The Hobbit that Peter S. Beagle actually helped write the screenplay for. So Last Unicorn was his successful book and he worked with a lot of the same animators to create the Last Unicorn movie, which a lot of children in the 80s and 90s, you know, remember very, very well because he helped write the screenplay. So it's, it's much shorter and you can't get by with just watching the movie, but he tried to make sure it captured a lot of the same themes as his book. But he had a long, decades-long, drawn-out drama with Granada Media, who were not basically paying him what they owed him um, for the use of that movie and the distribution of that movie. It's finally resolved in the past 10 years. But he's a talented guitar player, folk singer, and he's won many awards for his fantasy fiction, including the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, and the Ward Fantasy Award for Life the World Fantasy Award for Lifetime Achievement. 
The Last Unicorn, it is such a beautiful novel, my friends. Um, just a couple quotes to give you a sense of why did I choose this young adult novel for us. And these are lines from the book. Great heroes need great sorrows and burdens or half their greatness goes unnoticed. It is all part of the fairy tale. So again, almost like Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, like moving past just happy endings and good and evil and to look at more questionable and, and fluid conclusions, right? The clock will never strike the right time. You can strike your own time and start the count anywhere. When you understand that, then any time at all will be the right time. So I thought that was, you know, really poignant, especially as, you know, we're thinking about adolescence um, and when is the right time and when is my time and what does aging mean? I think that's really fascinating at this juncture when you're just about to become an adult to think about what aging and time and mortality mean. And um, men have heroes, but no man can ever be as big. Um, and I, of course, my face is covering my wonderful quote here. Just one second. So it says men have to have heroes, but no man can ever be as big as the need. And so a legend grows around a grain of truth like a pearl. And I think that's just a beautiful quote, both from the book, but in terms of if we think of folklore and fairy tales and American tall tales, like that's very true. And also, I think we tend to do that to celebrities to this day, that no one can ever live up to the ideal of what we need them to be. So we kind of create this mythos on our own. So the novel we're reading, The Last Unicorn. Let's take a look at this together. It's routinely listed as one of the top 10 fantasy novels of all time. I mean, it's just captured the imaginations of generations. Beagle started writing it in his early 20s, but he had so many ideas and just kind of got stuck in the narrative that he put it aside, wrote other things and came back to it and published it when he was 29. It was inspired by the fantasy and mythology that he read and encountered in his childhood. Again, he loved Tolkien, he loved Greek mythology, he loved fairy tales, and all of this is so present in The Last Unicorn. Uh, Viking Press published it in 1968, and to date, I think it sold more than 6 million copies. And what's interesting is the movie's been even more successful, um, and he had a big hand in that as well. It's been translated into 20 languages. They redid it as a graphic novel in 2014 with that same kind of um, style that you'll see in this image that is taken from the movie. It's this really beautiful blend of almost like, um, I, I could compare it to like, you know, uh, Japanime and Disney almost like came together. If you think like Sleeping Beauty and those two illustrative styles came together for both the graphic novel and the book. It's, uh, was targeted at young adults. I mean, it's technically a grade seven reading level, right? So, you know, middle schoolers could read it. Really, I would say it's more early high school. Um, but of course, you know, that young, it fits that young adult range, that 11 to 18 so beautifully. And that's why we're really looking at it. it it's got this bitter sweetness to it um, that kind of quept questions the kind of, well, I'll let you, I'll let you come to your own conclusions. But the way that we want life to be like didactic, good and evil, one and the other, and it's a lot more about the fluidity in between. The characters you need to know, and of course, they'll be unpacked in the book, and I think you'll have no problem reading it in a week. Yes, it's reading a whole book in a week, but A, it's wonderful, um, but B, it's, it's it's quick read. The language is very clear. The storyline um, you know, paces very well. So the characters, the unicorn, who also becomes the Lady Amalthea. And again, we need to think about unicorns and they kind of fit this paranormal idea of their eternal and how does she fit into the human world when she is eternal. Schmendrick, uh, the illustration of the magician on the right with the blue hat, is a young kind of near do well magician who struggles um, with his powers. Molly Grew, top right, um, a woman approaching middle age who's had this kind of uh, rough existence being married to kind of like a, an aged Robin Hood guy. Um, and you'll see the choices that she makes about maybe not sticking with that crew anymore. Mama Fortuna in the bottom right. Um, again, all this comes up very quickly. She's trying to control mad, like, you know, magic to the benefit of her traveling fare and just the consequences of that. Prince Lear, um, he was voiced by Jeff Bridges. Again, so many famous people in that movie. If you ever get a chance to see it, I recommend it. Prince Lear is second from the top on the right-hand side. Um, my right hand side. He's he's noble. He's you know his but his father is the evil King Haggard, who's in the bottom left hand corner, uh, who's in control of the Red Bull. And the Red Bull, I remember giving me <laughs> nightmares when I saw the movie as a very little kid, maybe a bit too young. But you can think about that um, 
good versus evil paradigm in terms of the unicorn and the Red Bull and what that means. Themes to consider, so messages, ideas that are explored throughout, aging in time, the loss of innocence, becoming disillusioned, which is very much about growing up, right? Losing that sense of magic and innocence and purity and safety. Truth versus illusion, what we want to believe, what are we are told, and what is actually true, which is, again, part of the trauma of growing up, right? Realizing that everything that you've been told is actually fits into both literal truth and your belief system. Love versus obsession, right? There's a very fine line between that. What is love? What is self-sacrifice for love? What is obsession? What is selfishness? And being the outsider. And I think you know, the unicorn is so often an outsider looking in, uh, a mouthy of the unicorn. And we can think about so many positions in life when a certain group, a certain person is left out and they feel like an outsider looking in. And we very much see that through her character. Things to consider as you begin reading the book, the symbolism behind different mythical creatures. And we can unpack that more um, after we've all read it. Illusions and intertextuality. So an illusion, if I wrote a story about a man and a woman standing in a garden and an apple fell and a snake wrapped around her leg, you'd be like, oh, Adam and Eve, that's an illusion. It's a reference to a text that a great number of people know. So whether it's Greek mythology or the Bible or a religion or a moment in history, you're going to see lots of allusions, especially to fairy tales and Greek mythology. Like what, what do you see? What stands out to you? Why this appealed so much to adolescents? Um, I'm not ashamed to say when I, you know, read this book, I wished I could turn into a unicorn and run into the woods. <laughs> like I just, it, it appealed to me all these things that we've talked about because it's such a traumatic moment in a person's development, right? Where you're trying to figure out who you are, what's true, what isn't true, what matters. Um, why, why do you think this book has been so uh, devoured, you know, read by so many generations of, of that age range? And finally, what do you think about the significance of the ending? It's a very different ending. It's not as dark as I promise uh, Hans Christian Andersen, but there is some bittersweetness there. And why do you think he didn't end with a sugar-coated Disney happy ending? Finally, intertextuality, right? We talked about this uh, with fairy tales. Like you can't just read the Grimm's brother, Red Riding Hood, without thinking about Perrault's Red Riding Hood, without thinking about the original folk tale, without thinking about um, what was written about the famines in the 1300s and the struggles that people had at that point, right? So all these texts are, are connected. So I just wanted to bring in the, one of the reasons I chose The Last Unicorn, why I chose a book from almost around 1970, is because it was both influenced by all the history we've talked about, right? Fairy tales, folklore, um, Robin Hood, you know, Grimm's Brothers, Greek mythology, Lord of the Rings, all of that let, you know, influenced Peter S. Beagle. And this book being so wildly successful, it was foundational and shaped writings by Neil Gaiman, who wrote Coraline and American Gods and, you know, so many other things. Um, J.K. Rowling certainly read it and it shaped her vision of the unicorn in Harry Potter. You know, I would, Oh, you know, I take on anybody who disagrees. Um, even Legend of Zelda, which one of my sons is obsessed with, I was reading him the part about the Red Bull, and he was like, "Oh my gosh, that's Ganon." It, it, it definitely, and I, you know, perhaps I think we can definitely see, you know, the resonance of the Last Unicorn in all these texts. So keep that in mind when you're reading um, Last Unicorn. Think about how it sparked imagination. Think about the meaning of the complicated ending. Think about how it blurs genre. And it's got that Bildungsroman in an untraditional way because the unicorn is eternal. She's not an adolescent, but she's kind of, by becoming a person for the first time, she's experiencing things as an adolescent. Keep that in mind. Can't wait to read your thoughts on this book and have a wonderful time reading it this week.